I started our Christmas series back on December the 2nd. It's called Divine Interruptions, and of course, what we've learned is really behind every, or in, ahead of every divine interruption is a divine invitation. Everyone in this story was interrupted. Their life was interrupted. Their schedule was interrupted. Their routine was interrupted. However, it was interrupted because God had a divine invitation in mind for them, something that would change their life, something that would change the world. And we're gonna talk about that. I started though by reading the very first verse of the, of the book of Luke, chapter one, verse one. It's the very first verse. I think it's important that we read this so we understand the importance as well as the uh, complete reality of the story in which we celebrate. Many have undertaken to draw up on a, an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So with this in mind, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I too decided to write an orderly account for you so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. I think it's very important that we understand this is not just a sweet story that we enjoy every December. We are celebrating a factual event of history. I was reading even today, there were some articles in New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Washington Post, different point, counterpoint of the reasons we believe in Jesus or his birth or the reason others don't. And it's really interesting. And so I've, I had a, the privilege of going to the Middle East and to Jerusalem when I was a high school student. And any doubts I had at the time were quickly squashed because I was able to stand there reading the Bible, looking at what it was talking about. I also had the, the I don't know why I took this class in college, maybe I had to, but it was archeology span and it was a fascinating class. And archeologists today are still finding, they're still digging and they're still finding things that continue to lead us right back to the Bible. And so I just think it's important that we understand this is an amazing story, but it's not just the stuff of nativity scenes in our homes or, or great music and worship even at Christmas time. This is something that happened because God had a point, a purpose. I wanna talk about that. We visited all the characters of the nativity this month, most all of them. We started with Joseph. <clears throat> Joseph says was a, he was a, um, a righteous man. Joseph was a righteous man. This man was highly respected. He was brilliant in what he understood of the law. And he was a diligent reader and study of the scriptures. And he was a truly righteous man. He's engaged to Mary. Now, when, in those days, when the engagement took place, it, that was where the binding law began. You were legally bound at the engagement, and then the wedding ceremony would take place sometime later. So an angel appears to both of them, letting them know that Mary is going to have a child. So Joseph knew for certain it was not his. Can you imagine his, the reputation he had in the community to being a righteous man, and now the woman he's engaged to is pregnant? It's a fascinating story if we saw it through to the end. And it was an amazing thing for him to be able to say he was going to divorce her quietly. Now, divorce was the no-brainer. The law allowed that. In fact, the law, if followed out in complete detail, Mary would have been paraded through town to her father's house and humiliated publicly. Joseph didn't want that for this woman that he loved. So he decided he would divorce her quietly. So no one, hopefully, would know. Then Mary, who's been revealed this story that she's going to have a child, she's a young woman, and maybe in the, who knows, maybe in that moment she might have thought, well, if that's what you say, you know, if this is real, and if this is real, and if this is really God sending a message to me, then I suppose I'm going to start feeling it in my stomach at some point, in my belly at some point. I'm going to have, a, I'm going to have this, I, this uh, clarity that what has been said to me by the angel is true. And so she had a comment to make as well. I think it's a phenomenal verse. I think it's one of the great verses of scripture, not that the rest of them aren't. I say this every week about whatever verse we're on. It's the best one in the Bible. So, um, I, but I love her response. And I've been challenged by her response for years when I'm living out of my comfort zone, which is most of the time. She said, may it be to me as you have said. 
May it be to me as you have said. And I don't know how many times I've looked at God and said, no, 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 may it be to me as I want. And God always had something so much better, something far more significant in mind if I would have just trusted him. Thankfully, I've learned that after a few years. Then you come to the wise men. It's some two years later, they find their way to the child's home. They had seen a star. They're astrologers. They were wise men. They would interpret dreams. They would interpret what the stars might be saying. People of those days thought that you could learn a lot about the past and the future and the stars in the sky. History does record there was some big event in the sky around the time Christ was born. So they've seen something happen. And so they begin to make their way to where this child is. Now, these are called wise men for a reason. They are very wise intellectually. And the gifts they were bringing would lead us to believe they were fairly well off. You don't carry gifts like those around. But I find it just incredibly uh, enlightening to watch these wise and wealthy men walk into the house where Jesus is, and the first thing they do is fall on their knees and worship him. That's the first thing they do. And I think that gives another picture for us to learn from, that I think anytime there's wisdom or wealth or those combinations, if it's wrapped in humility, God can do so much with that. And the wise men give us that example. But you know, honestly, I think it's the story of the shepherds that probably got to me the most uh, this last month and back in the late summer when we were looking at this evening. I think the shepherds give us a picture of why God came and what happened as a result. The shepherds, there's something you ought to know about shepherds. Now, <clears throat> I found a, a, a sermon title that I should have used, but it's too long to print. So just as a disclaimer, had, had I given a title that was printed on your, uh, in your worship folder, it would have said this. You ready? Here it goes. Here's my title. The Truth About Sheep, a sermon by someone who doesn't know anything about sheep but knows a little about humans and only a tiny bit about God, but it's going to take a shot at it anyway. <laughs> I have several really great books on shepherds and sheep written from a, a literal shepherd's perspective, modern day shepherd's perspective, and how they see the, uh, uh, the intertwining of their perspective with the shepherds of Bethlehem. They're great books, they're fascinating reads. <clears throat> so I was in the uh, study the other day, uh, pulling some of those books off the shelf. Philip Keller is a writer who's written some 50 books. He uh, lived this modern day shepherd and he had a lot to say about it because he knew what he was talking about. Now, it's interesting because earlier this summer, we had some painting done at the house, and we had to take all the books, box them up, and move them out of the study. So the study's painted, and then a little while later, we moved those books back in here, just uh, probably back in October, moved the books back in. And so Kim had really done a lot of the packing of the books, so I felt the least I could do was unpack them. And I'm really good at that. I can do that pretty quick, because I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna basically... Uh, uh, I could say this nicer, but I'm just gonna slap those things on the shelves. That <laughs> I was born in Tennessee, so it fits, right? I'm just gonna slap them suckers up on the shelves, you know? So that was my mission, and I did it fairly, I'm just putting those books up. Then Kim will walk in, she'll come in there and just pretty it up. She'll make it really pretty with pictures and plants and all kinds of things that you walk back in and go, wow, that's really cool, that looks great. So I'm unpacking the books, looking for my shepherd books. And I opened a box that we'd packed. Kim did most of the packing, I did the unpacking. And so I'd open a box of books of Kim's. It was Kim's book. She's read a lot of books. She has more books in our little study at the house than I do. And so uh, I start opening this box of Kim's books. And I kid you not, this is what was on the top of that box. I wrote it down on my phone because I didn't want to forget this. People all the last 36 hours have said, is that really true? No, I, liked, I love to lie in front of thousands of people at a time. Uh, <laughs> I almost brought the books today. I thought, I'm just going to take them so you'll, so you'll see them, you know. Well, here's, here's what I found, all right? See if this hits you the way it hit me. Here's the first book I put out of the box, Married to a Pastor. Okay. I'm glad she studied up on that. We've been doing this 35 years. Second book, Whatever Happened to Prince Charming? I'm serious. Third book, 
how to stay in love. I'm getting worried. I mean, I'm thinking she's keeping something. She's not telling me how miserable she is in this marriage. I didn't know she was that. I didn't know what, you know, I know I'm oblivious sometimes. Next book didn't help. How to know if you're really in love. And the last one, serious, Amish life. So I'm sitting there going, she's had enough of all this. She's had enough of the people. She's had enough of all the stuff that comes with it. She's ready to go live a simple life. Just get us a barn in the woods with a horse and no electricity and the simple life, you know, which I knew for sure. That is not what she's interested in because she for sure knows I'm not interested in that. But I sure had a moment where I thought, honey, do we need to call a counselor here? And she came and I said, look what I'm finding here. What's this mean? And she goes, well, I've read all those, but I didn't read them in that order. But... Uh, it's hard to convince me of that. So anyway, I'm, I'm going through the books on the shepherds and came across that and thought I'd just get that off my mind tonight. <laughs> what I learned about shepherds, and there are various diff- kinds of shepherds raising different kinds of sheep in different kinds of communities in those days. But these shepherds, according to what I'd read about it, was th- these, these guys were despised by the orthodox good people of the day. Shepherds found it nearly impossible to keep the details of ceremonial law. They could not observe all the meticulous hand washings and all the rules and the regulations that was somewhat customary to go to the temple. They just had very little chance to get that accomplished. The shepherds were very, very important, though. Understand this. See, they were raising lambs, the lambs that were needed for sacrifice, And one of the prize lambs would be when they could raise lambs that were considered unblemished. They were perfect in every way. The coat, the eyes, the limbs, everything was perfect about that lamb. So here are the gentlemen who are raising these animals so people can take them to the temple to be forgiven of their sins and the very people raising the animals could never get to the temple. They could never get clean enough. I mean, you had to go through these washings and these different ceremonies to be prepared to head to the temple. So the shepherds played this incredible role, and yet they themselves couldn't go to the temple with one of their own sheep. It was too difficult to be clean, being around constant dirty animals, dealing with animals that have constant cuts and bruises and blood and all that came with it. And here's what I find interesting. Today, the cleansing requirements are gone. Jesus was the last sacrifice, the Lamb of God, the unblemished Lamb. So no further requirements on those things anymore, yet so many people are trying to get to Jesus, trying to keep up this facade of never breaking the rules. So many people are are trying to get to Jesus and they're given the message that they're just not clean enough. I talk to so many people who walked out of church decades ago because they were so judged the minute they walked in. And I I apologize that there are churches like that. I've always appreciated something about this bunch from when I found this uh, church uh, uh, almost 40 years ago. from From the beginning, this has been a place where they wanted everybody to be invited. They're driven by making sure everybody knows that they're invited that they're included. It's in the DNA of this church. There's no other rationale for becoming a church that was once 100 people to what it is now today because we have been emphatic and passionate that everybody is invited. Everybody is invited, no exception. Everybody is invited. This has been in the DNA of this place from the very beginning. We'll celebrate next year our 60th anniversary as a church started Easter Sunday of 1959. And I'm thankful to be in a place where they've never ever shied away from doing whatever it would take to say to a community, you're included, you're loved, you're invited. It's been a clinic over in Portland, a community center. It might be uh, the, the getting into Joseph Harp uh, prison with the, with the message of Christ. We have almost 300 men down there attending our services every weekend. Earlier this uh, month, we were given the uh, the Volunteer Organization of the Year by the Oklahoma Department of Corrections for our work with Joseph Harp. And while we were there receiving the award, several of the wardens came up to me from scattered around Oklahoma and said, 
would you, would you put your service into our prison? And I said, sure. <laughs> then I said it like a dozen times. And then I thought, oh, you know what that costs? And uh, I came home and told the board what I'd obligated this to, and I'm still here. So, um, <laughs> and the board was just, as I've already told you earlier this month, how eager we are to see some of that happen next year. That comes from this, this basic DNA in this place of these people who said, we're going to do what Jesus did. We're going to be Christ-centered. We're going to love people like he loved us. We're going to forgive people like he forgave us. And I can't tell you how much that has meant to me to be a recipient of that as well as to help them lead that charge in this community. So it was no accident by any means that God appears to shepherds, that the angels come to shepherds, and they're the first invited to the barn to see Jesus. Here they had trouble all their lives getting to God, getting clean enough to get to God. They were always too dirty. And suddenly the angel says, hey, the Messiah has been born. You're invited. And they took off, it says they immediately went to find this child. They were invited for the first time in their lives. The angels didn't say, you need to go through the ceremonial cleansing. I'll give you the time to do that. I'll protect the sheep from getting close to you so you can really be clean and stay clean. No, they said, you're invited right now. Just like you are. You're now invited and welcome to the very presence of God in flesh. I love that about God. And we've spent too many years not knowing that about God. In the New Testament, we're told that Christ was born to be the lamb that was sacrificed. John said that Jesus was the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the last blood sacrifice ever needed. He took all of the sin, he took all of our sin on himself and declared all of us clean. John 10, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. Let me just mention a few things about our shepherd, Jesus. This shepherd never mentions the type or quality of sheep he demands. This shepherd never holds auditions. This shepherd never bases his protection and love and concern for us on how we look, feel, or behave. That's never mentioned as a basis for belonging to his flock. Those are just things we create as a basis for belonging because grace is just too offensive for us. So we've at times made the church into the high commission on sheep behavior and worthiness systems. Philip Yancey wrote a book, What's So Amazing About Grace? It's a great book. He was at a conference of world religious leaders. This is many, many, no, he heard about this conference. Yancey's still alive. But he heard about this conference many years ago, and C.S. Lewis was still alive, and C.S. Lewis was at the conference. There was a discussion going on among world religious leaders about the topic of Christianity and what was its contribution to the world. And Lewis responded, C.S. Lewis said, oh, that's easy. It's grace. And he was right. No other religion places grace at its theological center. It was a revolutionary idea because it seems to go against every instinct of humanity. We're naturally drawn to covenants and rules and cause and effect or earning what is deserved. I've always been a bit um, shocked at how reluctant people who've been forgiven are to forgive. The longer I'm a pastor, the more I don't get that. But part of that's because the longer I live, the more aware I am of just how much my sin cost Jesus, my shepherd. And I find it overwhelming that not only did God forgive me, he forgot it. And then he chose to use me anyway, knowing the worst about me, knowing the worst about us. He says, I'm still going to do something through you that is going to be unbelievable. Now, who else could offer that kind of a deal? And I think the more amazed I get of the grace of God, the more I'm completely baffled as to how could we have difficulty forgiving anybody, letting them off the hook, giving them a little taste 
what we've enjoyed. I never quite understand that. I'm sure there are reasons. 1 Peter 1.18 says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And here's how he did it. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless, unblemished Lamb of God. And in case you need any more affirmation that this was not just some cute story that was manipulated or made to look like it's real, let's go back 700 years before Christ was born to Isaiah 53. 700 years. See if this sounds remotely familiar. It was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten and we were healed. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. In other words, the perfect spotless lamb of God, the perfect unblemished lamb took on himself all of our flaws and sin and he became blemished. He became loaded with all the sin of the world and we became spotless, unblemished, forgiven lambs. I'm not sure how we'd possibly walk away from that. So I know there are many people who come to our worship service really every weekend, not just Christmas. And many people come in here feeling like an outsider. Maybe you thought you weren't good enough to be invited to walk around God's people or to walk with God, but now you know everybody, biblically, everybody is invited. This is not a new concept that we've come up with at Crossings. This is a concept from God himself. When those shepherds were approached by angels, the message was sent loud and clear. Everyone is invited. Everyone is included. Bring your questions. We're not afraid of those. We have this thing called Alpha we've been doing this year. It's been amazing. People don't really believe we're open to all the questions. Well, we get them, and there's some good ones. It's been amazing to people know we're okay with questions. You don't need to get all this stuff answered before you walk through the doors. This bright light that appeared to the outcast, undeserving shepherds, I think, could be represented to all of us tonight when we light the candles. And I think maybe that candle, maybe that little flame, will help you understand how loved you are, whether you feel it or not, that God really does notice you, whether you believe that or not, that he cares about you, that he has far more in mind than you could imagine, and he has included you through Christ, the spotless lamb. He's demonstrated for us a love, frankly, that cannot be comprehended. I would suggest for those who might be the skeptics in the room, we have that every week, which I love about this church. Would you just give some thought to praying a one sentence prayer? God, I'm not sure what I believe, but I'm open to what you might have for me. That's all you gotta do. Just see what happens. I'd be curious, frankly, to know what happens if you crack the door open just a bit to let God be God for you, to let you see just how long he's waited for you to accept the invitation to be free from the guilt and the regret and the past and live a new life that God would like to use us to live. And so we come to Christ, in my opinion, like shepherds, a bit confused, hard to believe we're even included, unsure of what it all might mean, but nevertheless willing and shocked that we would be so loved. Let's pray together. Father, we are just thankful, beyond thankful, humbled, when we sit still long enough to realize just how far you have gone to reach to those in which you've created. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to be able to be known by you in spite of all you know about us. And we thank you so much for loving us, giving us meaning in life, giving us a purpose while we're on this planet. 
And more than anything, Father, for forgiving us and loving us, we thank you in Jesus' name.